Uh, Ethereum and, and blockchain in general, but especially Ethereum is this uh, uh, ability of synergy. Really, we have people from every kind of industry defining their own problems. Yes, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not adequate blockchain problems, but, but it, either way, different kind of people, different kind of cultures and groups coming together and seeing there is something we can use Ethereum for and solving a problem with. And this is, of course, great because when you're on the same network or you're using the same token, there is an immense amount of interoperability and synergy within that. So what that should do is obviously it should drive a lot of adoption, right? Because we have you know, people from the UN, people from the bank sector, people from the music industry, they're all coming together around the same thing. And of course, it is, except there is a small problem. And this is something that most of you who are um, economists and relative technical guys have, have seen already is that... Um, we would think that blockchain technology is kind of the killer application for payments, right? That's what everyone heard. That's probably back in 2011 or something when you first heard about Bitcoin or whenever it was, that you could pay someone without any intermediary and you would just have sent money and that was it. Of course, that's not really how it works. Um, so we can do a quick like walkthrough, very easy. If you want to buy your first Bitcoin or your first Ether, but what is it you do? First, you download an app like Coinbase. Then you confirm your account. Then you send money with your bank account. And no, you don't get to use your credit card. You use good old regular EBAN Swift transfer. And you wait like two to three days. Then you have some money on an exchange. And then, boom, you're ready to the, adopt the whole innovative, explosive growth of you know, amazing Ethereum stuff. It's not really the greatest use case, right? It's not really the greatest way that we want payments to work like. It's not how payments are supposed to be, and it's certainly not the way the payments of the future are going to look like. So what I'm trying to get at here is that in order for uh, cryptocurrency to be used for payments, we have to outcompete existing centralized payment services instead of relying on them. And one of the ways we can do this is by using the original Ripple idea. And I'm saying the original Ripple idea because it's not what Ripple is doing nowadays. This is the original Ripple idea originally written by Ryan Fugger in 2004. And it kind of goes something like this. So you have a global payment network based, or a global ne network of payments based upon individual trust relationships. And if we forget payments for a minute and just talk about trust, this is similar to how you would use trust. And actually, it's completely like how you do trust in the real world. So I know a guy called Bob. I trust Bob. If Bob came over to me and said, hey, Christopher, do you know Sally? I would say no. Uh, well, Sally's my cousin. Can she borrow your bike? I would say yes, of course, because I trust Bob. So I know if something happens to my bike, I can go to Bob. Very simple. If we reintroduce payments into this, introduce credit lines, we, we have something called credit lines. And who do you have credit lines with? Exactly the same people that you trust in the real world. So your mom, your son, your dad, someone that you tr trust personally, you could give them a credit line of 10 euros. And this is something that you do already. For example, if you're, if you're hanging out with your mom and she forgets her credit card, you would lend her money to buy groceries, right? What happens there is actually you're giving her a credit line. Um, she's able to spend some money in the real world and you will get paid back at a later point in time. You don't need to set up an account or a contract to do that. This just kind of happens. What's cool then is if we could use this and set up bilateral credit lines, we could establish something called trust lines. What could we use trust lines for? Well, trust lines are bilateral credit lines um, which are set up in this payment network. And so if Alice and Bob have a trust line, they're saying, well, Alice says to Bob, I'll give you a trust line of 10 euros. You can spend 10 of my euros anytime you want. And Bob says the same. So if they're going out to buy beers, what happens is that Alice um, is now getting beers, or no, Bob is now getting beers. And so um, in order to pay for those beers on credit, what Alice does is she spends five of her $10 trust line with Bob, making her balance five and making his 15. So he has 10 of the credit line he originally has and then five that she owes him more. So in that point of time, we actually have money which is created. The imbalance between these two is where money is made. And that's kind of fine, of, fine and dandy, but eh, what's... It's not really that interesting because if it's just on credit pe that people trust with each other, then eh, how are we going to use that? What would be much more interesting was if Alice could use this to actually buy the beer and not have to just use it on the separate. So if Alice wants to pay Charlie and they don't know or trust each other, what we can use this payment network for of individual trust relationships is to look for a path where we can make a payment. And that path must, of course, have sufficient capacity. So if we have a path that runs through Bob, what we do then is we say, well, 
if I if Alice sends five dollars to Bob, that reduces her credit line or reduces the balance balance in her credit line, and then sends another five to Charlie. Charlie has now received five dollars. So what happens for for Bob here in this case? Well, for Bob, there's not really any difference because his net balance remains unchanged. Bob has fifteen dollars uh, of credit and can spend one place, and he has five in, in the other one, and so he has twenty total, right? For Charlie, this is good because, uh, or for Alice, this is good because she's now paid someone and gotten a beer, which is what she wanted. Uh, and for Charlie, this is good because he doesn't actually get money from Alice, he gets money from Bob, who he trusts. So he doesn't get the credit that he doesn't trust, he gets the credit that he trusts. So that's nice, not really super efficient, because you wake up in the morning now and you're like, okay, I need a bus ticket, uh, who do I have to settle with in order to get money in this network? But that's kind of the, the cool feature of the setup is that we mostly don't have to settle. So if we add Dave into this equation and then he now wants to pay Bob. When there are many trust lines or when there's a network of many trust lines, debt flows in many directions. And so this creates a circular flow of money, meaning debt cancels out over time. Um, Payments go in multiple directions, and so real-world settlements are mostly not necessary. As you can see here, Dave makes a payment to Bob, which cancels out his debt with Charlie. However, relationships, they are not static. Sometimes they change. Sometimes people have fights, and they don't like each other anymore. So Alice and Bob, they um, get into a big fight, and they don't like each other. It would be kind of easy if Alice was just old Bob. She would just pay him and then say, I never want to see you again. You know, pay the debt and then close the trust line. It's a little bit different if Bob owes her money because she's not going to say, I never want to see you again. By the way, please give me 10 euros. Um, but there is a function in the system called payment to self, which allows you to control the individual trust lines you have so that you can, um, so that in this, in this instance, um, Bob becomes indebted to Ed, who becomes indebted to Alice. And for Ed again, his net balance remains unchanged. For Bob, well, he was already in debt, so now he just, he's just in debt with another person who he trusts and has a trust line with. Um, and for Alice and Bob, they can now close their trust line because it is zero, so they no longer need to, to have that open. Why is that a good fit for blockchain? Why is that a good blockchain use case? Well, it involves a lot of trust. Um, like all credit and debt, it involves that if you don't have somewhere to settle this, a global ledger where everyone can see the same thing, it's very difficult to manage whether or not things actually happen. So it's very good when you have a blockchain where you can see um, the debt relations of everyone. So the Trust Lines Network is two things. It is a decentralized protocol for customizable and interoperable complementary currencies. And it's a MoMA payment application with a focus on ease of adoption. So let's start with the last one first. On the Trust Lines network, remember how I told you about the onboarding experience of getting a regular cryptocurrency, or right now, but on the Trust Lines network is a little bit different. So there's no registration. You don't need to confirm your identity with the, with the account you're using. You don't need a bank account. You don't need a credit card. You don't need to deposit money. And most importantly, you don't need any F. Nonetheless, you can start doing payments within a minute. So that's pretty unique. And the way that works is you download an app from an app store, whichever one you want. And you join by creating a trust line with a friend. And then you start sending and receiving payments. And that's it. So some of the things you can do with the trust line network is, for example, you can get access to cryptocurrency. So if Alice wants to buy ETH. She thinks there's a lot of cool applications. She wants to use that now, um, but she doesn't have any. Uh, well, what is she going to do? She wants it, but uh, she knows that, that Dave has some, but they don't know or trust each other. Well, we can host the uh, ETH, or the what Dave does is, is he hosts the ETH on, he sells, offers the ETH on a decentralized exchange, and he says, I will sell ETH for 50 euros a piece um, if someone is willing to buy it for that price. And Alice says, that's a great price. I want to buy that ETH. So she sends $150 of trust line money to Dave. And if there is a path of sufficient capacity, meaning if we can credit Dave in the network with $150, um, well, we do an atomic transaction well, where um, Alice gets the ETH and Dave now has $150 of trust line money he can spend. So this solves the dependency on centralized exchanges and removes the requirement of having a bank account and also removes the requirement of meeting in the real world. So I'd like to compare this to uh, my local bitcoins, if you're familiar with that, except from the comfort of your own couch. It does require that there's a sufficient amount of users who are willing to sell F in the network. 
Another bonus for, for us is that it allows us to give a very good onboarding experience because, of course, you know, we're not magicians. You do have to pay gas in order to, to send uh, transactions to the Ethereum blockchain. And if a new user were to join and they had no ETH, obviously they would have to pay for that gas. But what we can do is the onboarding person sends a small amount of ETH when they onboard someone, and that pays for quite a substantial amount of transactions. So that creates a, a demand for ETH in the system. And it also creates a an, natural an interest to, to get ETH. One of the cool applications to that is, at some point in time, you will most likely need to buy more. When you need to buy more, you will have an easy way of purchasing that ETH. Furthermore, ETH can be used to interact with any um, application on this ecosystem. So basically, you download the app, you connect with a friend, and you get access to the whole ecosystem. Another application we're think, uh, we're looking at we have is uh, called people powered money, and people powered money refers to there are three t kinds of money in this world. There's bank money, there's government money, and there's complementary currencies or people powered money. And the basic idea is that um, we're getting we're seeing a digitalization of different kinds of currencies. There's di many different kinds of money being made right now. The question is how can we use that? on an open decentralized protocol to enable people to build their own kinds of money. That sign sounds completely insane, but it's not actually that far-fetched. When you think about, for example, frequent flyer miles, an amazing application of complementary currencies, very, very powerful, very, very good, creates a lot of revenue for, a lot, for some companies. In some cases, for example, American Airlines has 50% more revenue from frequent flyer miles than they do from selling seats. So why is that? Well, they have a lot of fixed costs on planes, no matter what, a plane costs a lot of money to take off. And obviously, when you have a lot of fixed costs and you can't always sell seats for regular money, having a complementary currency to encourage those sales is a great use case. So wouldn't it be awesome if there was an open protocol where it wasn't limited to someone who just has a lot of trust, a lot of money, and a lot of inter interoperability with banks to create that, but regular guys could do the same thing because they were using a transparent protocol where anyone could expect the code and say, this looks interesting, this looks trustworthy, I trust this kind of money, I will integrate that into my bus driving company. Some other applications are expenses, loan savings, and crowdfunding. I'm not going to say too much about those, except it's very useful to, do, to have digital payments when you don't have a bank account and get access to digital payments if you're amongst the two billion people who don't have bank accounts. How was the time? Should I? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Currency networks are in smart contracts. They're hosted on owner their own separate co smart contracts. The interoperability, cross-currency payments, we use F as a bridging gap token, as a bridging token between the different networks. So the reason why we use a decentralized protocol to do this and the reason why it's not, um, why it's different, for example, than just having a bunch of separate applications that run this on their own is, of course, that we can use F as a way for different currency networks to trade with each other. And it works very similar to how um, the um, F2, P2P, F2 uh, uh, fiat exchange does. The architecture on chain, the mobile app is where we sign transactions. We use relay servers to relay transactions. We have a bunch of fees. We can come ask about those later, but basically we have two kinds of fees. We have trust line money fees and we have gas fees. The trust line money fees, we only uh, really have to incentivize debt cancellation and have a, a balanced network. And the fees, the mandatory fees, where well, we have those so we can send transactions to the Ethereum blockchain. So this is an old and powerful idea. If in implemented on Ethereum, it has a completely unique onboarding experience that can drive mass adoption to uh, blockchains and aims to deliver um, scalable and decentralized permissionless global payments based on people-powered money. It's in development at BrainBot Technologies. We have a working prototype, which we hopefully will release next week. Um, if you're interested in this, check out the website and uh, read our white paper. Ask any questions here or on Slack. Uh, and if you think this sounds cool and you want to develop on it, to join our or apply to join our development team. Thank you. Why didn't I mention this? Mm, because I thought it was f more interesting to talk about people-powered money. We explained it a lot. And well, if I was here for an hour, I would love to talk about the unbanked as well and people-powered money. But since we're using this term, I felt like we should go more in depth with that. But the unbanked is obviously a, a huge um, application on this because 
if you don't currently have digital payments and you don't currently have a bank account, but you are getting smartphones and the smartphone penetration is increasing um, in areas where we see large populations of unbanked people, of course, getting access to a mobile application where you can do digital payments and, payments and savings and where you can actually, I mean, even if you, <coughs> wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a killer use, killer application. Yes. Question there? Yes. weights on these, on these cards, and uh, you assume that, that uh, the whole graph will basically, um, like the weights, they will, they will always go to zero, in, in the end they, they, will, they, will, uh, they will go back to, to zero point. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, how can you assume that, so why, why, why is that? And uh, the other question is, um, as far as I know, it's very, very uh, difficult to find paths in graphs. So how do you solve that probably of the problem of finding That's these really complex... Uh, it's my, it's my answer. Uh, it's <laughs> two technical questions, kind of. So for the first one, we use fees. Mm -hmm. So in order to... Yet we've been talking about the rebalancing, right? How do we cancel out debt? Yeah. Um, how do we make sure that the balances don't go into one direction, but whether that we use a uh, path that have to rebalance and that's, we do that by having an uh, according fee structure. We have a fee structure where it's more expensive to add more imbalance and it's cheaper to reduce imbalance. Mm -hmm. so and then the pathfinding algorithm tries to find a path which is the cheapest. Right? Um, for the pathfinding, you're right, we cannot do that on a blockchain, we cannot do that in a mobile phone, therefore we have um, auxiliary helper services, like a federation of services which know the current state of all the trust lines and their balances and their capacity and then you can just query them and ask them hey please give me a path from Alice to say Charlie that's how it works there's a question yes um, in traditional banking IT when you have a debt it's just a number with a minus sign in front of it in blockchains money or assets are represented as cryptographical primitives how do you represent negative yeah. Well, yeah, and all that's primitive. Is there a way already to do so? That's not a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So the important thing here, the trust lines, that's not tokens. It's not tokenized like you could count positively, like there's one token, three tokens, and you can pass them around. Here you re really have balances, like in banking. And these balances can be negative. And the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, supports that you can represent negative values. Yes, I know. But you cannot uh, verify cross nodes that a balance or an asset is negative as a debt. You can't do this, or you cannot. Uh, well, this is a question that's not a claim. Can you pass around this? Uh, this is super uh, sorry. Um, can you make this in a hybrid blockchain or in consortium blockchain so others can look into this uh, asset and see that it's a debt? Yes. A centralized system because you say you have a record, like traditionally, which says someone owes. Yes. Or is it, it cannot be passed around? Uh, the debt can, in this special system, not be passed around because uh, the uh, balance always only exists between two participants, right? They have between them and balance or imbalance. It cannot be passed around. It cannot, if you're indebted to me, I cannot pass that to someone else who then uses the money I would, or the credit I have with you uh, to pay for something. That's so not how it works. There's no way people can exchange debt independently. Here, here, there's no way to trade debt. To trade debt, no. Okay. Yes. Do you know how much time will it take to, the, to do a transaction from one to the other, and how big this network can be? How much? How much time it will take to do one transaction? Yeah. Do you want to know that? How big this is? Mm, no, not really. Do you know? This? But it takes us very quickly. In the first incarnation of the system, we built on the Ethereum 
blockchain on the public chain as it is, jail will be as fast as we have transactions in Ethereum that's around 15 seconds. But you should wait some um, more blocks for confirmation. So say 15 seconds for you get initial um, um, confirmation that the transaction is valid, and then, then you're already 90% <coughs> sure that it will go through, and then wait 10 seconds or whatever, and, and you, you get the longer you wait, the more um, sure you can leave that transaction. It will never be reversed on something. The more people there is in the network, then the more. No, that's actually not a problem. That's not a problem. It's then the <laughs> yes? Uh, what happens if the trust line is broken by an unforeseeable event like debt? Because if there is debt to the union, this trust line can uh, contain several notes. <coughs> if a trust line is broken, the person who has who, the next person whom you have that trust line with, but that would be the person who would be liable for that amount. If you mean what happens in terms of how do how would you settle if if one person dies or disappears? Yes. You are relating that one person is not born, but what happens when one person has two forms or two? It's just a new line of debt. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, if you if you have since you're 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 always going to be confirmed by your identity. So if you for some reason would want to have two different accounts with two different trust lines, people would the people in who you have trust lines with would know that that is the same person because it's people that you know in the real world who confirm them. Does that answer your question? Uh, but that, that's not it, that's not relevant for the Ed guy because if like if if Ed is here and there's like six nodes between Ed and the person with two accounts and something happens here, Ed has nothing to do with that. Ed has something to do with Charlie who is next to him because that's the person he has a trust line with. So basically, if you would want to play that that out, what what would happen is the person who is closest to the person with two accounts would say, "Hey, something is missing here. I have a trust line with you. What's going on? Why?" Um, why are you defaulting on, on one or whatever it would be? So, if I understand, I mean, you're, you're managing pretty much um, uh, credit scores somewhat. So, so I have uh, a trust line, I have 100 uh, Facebook friends, and everybody I say, okay, uh, like, uh, I trust you on dollars which could put me in debt of $10,000. My question is actually what I understand if you want to find the cheapest path between two parties. That's actually an P complete problem to solve. That's one thing. And then once you've found it, do you need to lock it? Because otherwise, if you have parallel um, uh, uh, transactions running on the system, uh, you should prevent a graph from being broken from another transaction because otherwise you might have a deadlock. How do you manage that? Yes. <coughs> so the pathfinding server proposes a path, and uh, it must not be the optimal path. Okay. Any path which works and is cheap. And we can say there's probably no cheaper pass, most likely no cheaper pass. That's a good enough solution at that point. Um, and then actually send the transaction into the blockchain. You say that's the pass A, B, C, D, E, <coughs> and then gets applied to the state atomically, right? So the account updates are all done within one transaction. That's one atomic transaction. So during that transaction, you will have not conflicts. What could happen though is obviously that the pass bank sort of proposes a path. And you send a transaction in, and there's a conflicting transaction that came before that, and so that the password's not viable anymore. That can happen. But then, um, well, the transaction does not go through as accepted, but throws an exception, and then you just try again. So that's, say, up to optimistic coherency that we have here. Most likely, there's never a, a conflict. Yes? Um, I'm curious, how, how robust is uh, the network to attack vectors? Mm. Is 
Can, you could participate in a currency network where that is built in, so you can you can have uh, there's, there are governance hooks implemented. Uh, they can be delegated to, for example, smart contracts, where you can have um, a limit on the amount of credit lines that can be set, or a limit on the total level of of, of credit that can also be given in an individual credit line. So that would be the ideal currency network for you then. Good thing yeah. here is it's on the blockchain, so you always your say your smartphone or AI or whatever the algorithms is on your smartphone could check what's going on in the network, you would immediately notice that one of your friends is mostly indebted. And so then he would reduce the credit line. If he's indebted to you already, you would try to do a debt cancellation transfer so that he's instead indebted to someone else and less to you, and then you reduce the credit line. Um, so there's, because of the blockchain, all data is public. You don't know who's, who these persons are except for your, for your private friends. Um, you have ways to see how uh, the credit roofiness is and how the spending behavior is or indebtedness of the friends is. And if they're very indebted, you probably ask them what's, what's wrong, why are you increasing your debt from week to week? Can I help you? Hopefully. Thanks, would say, ah, I can see your account. So we hope that also the social aspect is um, more important this time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so you want to prevent imbalance through fees. So in a way that if you want to create imbalance, you have to pay more fees, which then, uh, when there's imbalance, right, it would act as an incentive for people who would want to offset that fee, uh, that imbalance in kind of way by lowering the fees. Is that correct for them? You, you're referring to the to the imbalance fee now? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there, there, will basically, there will basically just be several paths in, in a scenario where there will be several paths um, the system will take the one, or we will add a fee to the ones that create a higher imbalance. So if we have like uh, one path which creates an imbalance of, of 20 and one which creates an imbalance or reduces the, the imbalance to zero, meaning that there's people who owe each other less in that, in that trust line, obviously the, this, or the, the other paths that, cr that create the higher imbalance would be more expensive. So the system would prioritize the cheaper one in that scenario. So, but in the, in the way that we get more people like to offset the imbalance as well, if like they don't have to pay fees. Yeah, exactly. So, no, so they don't have to set. What was the last part? Uh, that that uh, it's also like to offset the, the fees, uh, the, the the to offset the imbalance. Um, not charging people fees is like an incentive to, for that. That's yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have analyzed uh, if it's possible to apply concepts from, from Raven to uh, trust lines. Yes, actually, Raven inspired trust lines in the other way around. Um, in Raven, we have the same setup. There's multiple nodes, and we find paths between multiple nodes to do a payment into, to those which don't have direct path. And the only difference is in Raven, we have to use collateralized tokens. So you always get 
can get these tokens on the blockchain while in trust funds we use trust relationships. So there's some personal debt relationship between two. So this gives the uh, compatibility. Yeah. The, the problem is a bit, um, in rate we assume that these nodes or phone nodes are always online, so they can help us the routing. Uh, but as trust tags will be based on smartphones, and your smartphones are mostly sleeping or not on the network or whatever, so they cannot help us interfere with the currently first booking internet communication of that system on the current blockchain. Okay. All right, so thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being patient with a little overhead and time. Um, I think the public will be open. Until the end. Um, the end. Well, open it. No. <laughs> uh, is, is, is there a is there a fix end? Okay. Okay. So <laughs> thanks to the speakers, and thanks to Price Water speakers for sponsoring, and thanks for the final stuff for the donation. Woo.